All right, everybody, welcome back. Hope you had a good sleep. Hope you enjoyed yesterday. This is Gettysburg 155 Facebook Live. Um, I'm Gary Edelman with the American Battlefield Trust. That is Chris White behind the camera over there. Trust me, he's there. Connor Townsend joining us as our normal social media guru. We got De uh, Lieutenant Dan, Donation Dan behind the camera as well. Connor might try to steal some of that moniker from him today. And you're on the Gettysburg Battlefield. We are on the south end of the battlefield here. Sorry that we're going live a little bit late today, but there's connectivity issues on the south end of the field. We'd rather go live later and make sure you can get a better product as we go along. So hit us with your questions. We'll do our best to answer them as we go along. And let's really engage as we take the toughest hike of this particular um, live and probably one of the toughest um, pieces of terrain over which either army had to to go during the Battle of Gettysburg. So let's just start this out real quick. Let's bring up our good friend Doug Downs, licensed battlefield guide, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, U.S. Army War College. What's going on around here, Doug? Okay, great. So good morning. We are now on the morning of July 2nd. The Union Fishhook Line has started to take its shape at 8, well, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Confederate uh, Robert E. Lee is going to send his engineer, Sandler Johnson, is going to go down here to the southern end of the field. He's going to figure out where the southern end of the Union Line is. And what they're going to do is they're going to start marching the Long's Creek Corps behind the this ridge line with the idea that they get beyond the end of the Union line and they attack up Seminary Ridge now or Cemetery Ridge. Now what's going to happen is they're going to come out of this tree line at about three o'clock in the afternoon. They're going to find out that the Union Army is not back where they thought it was but it's 500 yards away. They're going to have to change their plan and so what they do is they extend their battle line down this road where we're looking today almost a mile further to the south and what they're going to launch is what we call an, an echelon attack. Now you can think of this a couple ways. You can think about this like a wave hitting a beach on an angle or I like to think about it as dominoes falling from south to north and what they're going to do is this is team war fighting in 1863. Men that attack from the south are going to try and flank the Union line. If they don't what they're going to do is buy a reaction that the Union will pull troops from some other part of their line and as the Confederates continue to launch these dominoes eventually a domino will hit a piece of the Union line from where they pull those Union troops. Great, excellent, Doug. Thank you so much. So we're talking about that uh, Robert E. Lee is going to have um, Hood's division, McLaw's division, and maybe elements of another division under a guy named Anderson. So maybe 16,000 troops are going to make this attack. General, come on up here. We've got General Robert E. Lee here with us today. Um, General Lee, a.k.a. Frank Orlando, come on up here a little bit closer. I want to know, General Lee, what are your chances for today as we are on July 2nd? Well, when you consider what transpired yesterday, our chances are very good. Good. Most definitely. And of course, we, we had a situation, and I'll be honest with you, had Stewart been here, you know, instead of not arriving until tonight, this whole situation must have been, might have been quite different. He's supposed to be the eyes and ears of the infantry, and here he is. I mean, he, one of the things he's supposed to tell us about is the topography. And he's not here. We have no idea about the terrain here. Okay, good. But nonetheless, you've come up with a plan. And from what I know, yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're supposed, you want your troops to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Are all your commanders, mainly your main one, James Longstreet, on board with this? Let me put it this way. June 1st, 1863, when Jefferson Davis appointed me to command what was to become the Army of Northern Virginia, there was one man who thought otherwise. He thought he should have been appointed to command the Army of Northern Virginia. And from that point, you know, he's like a little kid. You know, he didn't get what he wanted, so he was going to take his football and go home. All right? So my leadership style is one of uh, discretionary. All right? So you surround yourself with quality leaders and then have them enact my battle plan. All right? Utilize the strengths of the battle plan he knew that we could do this. I don't understand what he was thinking. He dragged his heels. In fact, he dragged his heels up to 1864. Oh man, Lee, I wish you'd tell us how you really felt. <laughs> no, you don't want to go there. And normally I don't criticize my men in public, but you know, for something in situations that, that man, the greatest crime any military man can commit is insubordination, <laughs> plain and simple. And he was insubordinate on the second day and the third day. Okay, let's let's talk to you. You right. gave me the perfect transition. I'd like to bring up Mary Turk Mina here. Um, Mary Turk Mina's been a guide up at Gettysburg for years here. Remember, it's 50 years in women in guiding. Um, so it's just great to have one of the 17 female licensed battlefield guides here today. So what we're talking about in not following orders, I think when we really talk about someone who didn't want to go up the Emmitsburg Road, we are talking about Hood's division. So what's going on with this division, Mary, if I may? All right, so Hood's division, <laughs> again, uh, Hood is, we've got General Lee here, I am not John Bell Hood, he is six foot tall, blonde, a ladies man, so we have a lady guide for this. Uh, uh, Hood 
brings his, his division here, when he brings his division here, he's one of the rising stars of the Army of Northern Virginia. He's ready to go. He's from Kentucky. Uh, but when Kentucky decides not to secede, John Bell Hood goes with Texas. He served with Robert E. Lee out in the West early, at, early on as a cavalry commander before the Civil War, joins up for the Civil War with Texas, brings his brigade here, or his division here. He's ready to go. But when he gets here and he sees what's just been described, he doesn't like it at all. And he asks Longstreet multiple times, how many times, General? I hate the thing. <laughs> <laughs> lots really and do. lots of times. I don't want to go there. Let me go around to the right. Um, Hood will, as we'll see, not be allowed to do that. By the third or fourth time he asks, the orders are clear, go attack. And Hood will do his job, do it well. Uh, he'll be wounded here, as we'll see. He'll be wounded later in the war again uh, and ends up having a rather unsuccessful last couple of years during the Civil War. That's great. Thanks, Mary. And let me say that, you know, we're along the line of the Texas Brigade here, um, and you've got Texans and Arkansans. We'll talk about them in a second as we're coming up. But, you know, so it's the Texas Brigade that is coming up here, and they supposedly overhear General Hood. Somebody yes. remembered this much later yes. saying, very well, when I get under fire, I will have a digression. In other words, for all the discussion about whether Longstreet went up the Emmitsburg Road or somewhere else or anything like that, Hood's division, or the part thereof, actually ended up doing something pretty close to what Hood had proposed anyway. Hood said this was the only time he ever, uh, you know, disputed an order or protested an order in his military career. Longstreet sort of agreed with Hood, but in a slightly different way. Let me bring Tim Smith on up here, because here we do have, in the Emmitsburg Road, and we'll show you this terrain eventually, but, you know, it's sunny over there right now. You wouldn't be able to see it too well. You know, we have the Emmitsburg Road. We know that Robertson's brigade um, straddled the Emmitsburg Road. So can you lay out sort of the brigades in Hood's division here and, and where we well, stand? Sure. So uh, Hood's division at Gettysburg consists of four brigades. And the plan basically, uh, as we believe it was laid out, and when I say that, it's not like there's a lot of documentation about uh, the planning of this attack on July 2nd. Um, but there's four brigades of about 1,500 men each. And we're talking about two brigades in front and two brigades to the rear. So the two brigades in the front of Hood's division are going to be Lowell's Alabama Brigade, Evander Lowell, and then of course we have uh, um, Hood's Texas Brigade with the Arkansans, and then behind them are two brigades of Georgians under the command of uh, Henry Benning and uh, George Anderson. And basically um, these attacks, the two front brigades will head across the open fields, uh, soften up the Union line, and Theoretically, the two rear brigades will follow behind them. Good. One of the interesting things I was going to point out is that um, Hood is probably the best division commander in the Confederate Army. And Hood's division um, are ready to go, but at the very outset of the fight, General Hood is wounded. And um, the plan of the attack doesn't really come off the way we believe it was supposed to occur. In other words, initially, Benning's brigade is supposed to follow Law's brigade. But because of the wounding of Hood and because of the confusion of battle, uh, Benning's brigade will actually shift northward and follow uh, Anderson, I should say, follow Hood's Texans towards Devil's Den. So in a perfect world, if this attack had come off as it, we believe it was planned, Benning's brigade would have attacked Little Round Top along with Law. But he doesn't, he attacks Devil's Den. And let me just tell you, uh, uh, you might know, I'm a big fan of Henry Benning's brigade. And wherever that brigade hits, that area is going to fall. And yeah, uh, that's good. And just real quick, what's Henry Benning's middle name? Rock. Rock. No, that's his nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Old Rock or Rock, what's his middle name? Oh. Henry, Henry L. L. Yes. Come on, I thought you loved Benning here. Okay, Henry Lewis Benning, Rock Benning. Tomorrow I'm going to do a quiz on generals that have middle names and nicknames, and we're going to be all ready for that, but I forgot that book at home. Um, I want to ask Tim one more thing. We want to get stepped off. We're going to leave General Lee where he belongs here on the line when we do, but Tim, tell us about this monument, and I'm going to get ready to maybe, uh, to maybe knock on the sides of oh, so this is the Oh, so this is the Arkansas Monument. I believe it's dedicated in 1964, off the top of my head. I don't know. Um, but the Arkansas Monument is a kind of an interesting monument as, a state mo as state monuments go. There's only one regiment from the state of Arkansas at the battle, and that's the 3rd Arkansas Infantry of Jerome Robertson's brigade. Uh, and, and sometimes they're referred to as the 3rd Texas because it's primarily a Texas brigade. 
but uh, the monument was dedicated and it has uh, little square Confederate cubes on the, uh, around the base of the monument and they are made out of aluminum. At the aluminum because they're producing a lot of aluminum in Arkansas at the time. Now, we're going to step off for the charge. We're going to talk in detail about the charge as we go. Everybody will just chime in as we go. But before we go, General Lee, any last words to wish us well on our, uh, on our attack, sir? Oh, most definitely. All right? Be successful. That's all I ask. Okay. All right? Because I'm tired of hearing people say to me, you should have let me go around to the ride. <laughs> right. Well done. Yeah. And that's pretty interesting. In the Gettysburg movie, you know, go around to the ride. They could just roll rocks down on you. Those are all based in actual quotes. They don't exactly say them the right way exactly, but it's actually based in a little bit of truth. So are you all ready for the oh, attack? Let me, let me just mention oh. that what I think is interesting about what he said is that, you know, people over and over again has, have suggested that, you know, they, they follow Hood's plan which, you know, looking at whatever Hood is suggesting, I, I don't think it's a very good idea to try to march around Big Round Top at that point in the day. But I guess we know what happened did not work. So everything seems like a better idea. <laughs> but Hood at Gettysburg is given credit for being this like military genius. I mean, what did Hood do when he had his own independent command? What did Longstreet do when he had his own independent yeah. command? Oh Keep those yeah. things in mind. Uh, the fish stinks from the head, and very few people. The view is good from the cheap seats. When you're in command, when you're That's the big right. boss, it's a whole different story than being the second or third. Um, General, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. And uh, let's go. All right. All right, watch out for the sun, y'all. We can't control that. Have a glorious day, folks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We shall make you proud. All right, be careful going over the wall, y'all. Not only for our safety, but we want to protect the historic resource here. So, uh, Tim, we are on the Snyder property. Is that right? Is this house here during the battle? Yes, it is. Philip Snyder. And um, the house has been restored. And, of course, I think everyone enjoys the fact that they decided to put an outhouse um, near where an outhouse may have been. And I, uh, thinking about it, this may be the only restored outhouse on the Gettysburg National Military Park. That's pretty cool, good. So, uh, licensed guides, anybody else, we are walking along, the attack has begun. I like talking about how Dick Childers, who was particularly good on the way up here, getting rations, he had gotten some good Pennsylvania biscuits, um, and Dick Childers had him in his haversack, and during the shelling that preceded this attack, and it was a real deal, hour-long bombardment, um, a shell came in and hit him in the haversack. It didn't strike him, but it struck the haversack alone. And, um, you know, it, he was rolling around in agony, supposedly not necessarily because he was hurt, but because he had lost the biscuits he had worked so hard um, to get along the way. Later, by the way, he would not perform so well. He would desert to the Union Army and become a galvanized Yankee, as far as I know. Doug? So we've set up with the infantry. But remember, they're supported by artillery out here as well. So this is Henry's battalion. He is also from Kentucky, not unlike General Hood, because he's an adopted Texan. You think about what he has. He's got four batteries out here, but really this attack that we're going to walk today is supported by two of those artillery batteries. At the very end of the Confederate line, what we'd have is Riley's battery of six guns, and it's a mixed battery. Remember, Confederate batteries are not all uniform like Union batteries tend to be. Um, and so in this case, you should think about uh, he's got two Napoleons, two three-inch rifles, and two Parrot rifles. And then from where we are supporting this, this is Latham's battery. Now, Latham's battery is almost right in the middle of this Texas assault. So we are at the very northern end of it. He's got five pieces of artillery here. Uh, really, he's got three Napoleons and then a mixed bag. He's got a 12-pound howitzer and the only six-pound howitzer on the battlefield here at Gettysburg. Really cool. So, Mary, if you could come on up here. So, I've never been out in this field with you. If you were to lead a tour out here, and most people don't lead a tour out here, what would you be talking about now? We're, we're making the attack. We're under artillery fire. What's going on? Well, we're making the attack, and think about the ground that these guys were intended to use on the way up. Nice open fields all the way up, and now, what are they in? Broken ground, we call it. There'll be rocks. There's high, there are fields of grain here. It's difficult work, and these regiments and, and brigades, because Hood goes down, will end up fighting essentially by themselves. So little coordination, as Tim mentioned, and it becomes a very strange attack because nobody's really quite sure what the plan is. And if you think about it, we're actually at a great spot because we just talked about Hood going down. So if we look over at the Bushman farm, it talks about Hood after he starts this attack, 
He starts from the center of his old Texas brigade, and then he's going to ride to the center of his division, and he talks about being in a peach orchard. Now, it's while he's there that a shell will explode over his head, and he will lose the use of his right arm. Think about that. The division commander's down within the first 10 to 20 minutes of this attack. And think about how that ripples down against all the other units that are in this. And we're certainly going to see this come to play as brigades will become intermixed in these two fights that we're about to talk about. And specific to what Doug said, here you've got Hood goes down. He's the division commander. Evander Law, the next senior brigade commander, he's off on his way to Big Round Top. And we cannot tell that he issues a single order at a division level till the fight is over. Well, specifically, Hood will take over the division eventually, James L. Sheffield will take over the brigade, and someone will take over the 44th Ala 48th Alabama from Sheffield. I think that's a guy named Lawrence, and then someone's going to take over his company. See, you have all these people doing new jobs during a particularly chaotic event. That just can't be good. The Union Army on the ridge, even when they sustain losses, and they didn't sustain as many, you are talking about a command that is staying together. The brigades are not intermingling. A huge advantage for the Union Army. Ultimately, the Confederates will end up bringing five or six hundred more soldiers to the scene than the Confeder than the Union was able to muster. And I don't want to spoil the end, but that is going to really tell for the Confederates here. Now, let's stop for a second and gather ourselves because we really haven't looked at the terrain around us. Um, whether that's Tim or somebody else, what are we looking at? Well, I was going to point out that, of course, there is the Bushman farm uh, down there off to our south. And uh, that is the farm, uh, as Doug mentioned, near that John Bell Hood is wounded near that farm. Uh, so that's the Bushman property. We have some of the Snyder property that we're uh, traveling on. If you look back, the Philip Snyder farm, um, that beige sort of house can be seen from uh, Little Round Top. Um, and when we get up there, you can see her very clearly from Devil's Den. Also, um, off here, let's sw swing around a little bit. You see, we have the Rose Farm in the distance. We're getting ready to cro cross some of the property of George Rose. That guy owns like 230 acres of ground. And, you know, depending on how you figure the numbers, I know that liars figure and figures lie. But uh, um, something like 19,000 Americans will cross that property during the battle. There's something like 9,000 casualties on the Rose Farm and what used to be part of the Rose Farm. So, you know, just for a single farm, that might be like the bloodiest single farm in American history. And then, of course, if you look north, what I think is interesting, you can see the peach orchard. And the peach orchard is actually um, where the Union artillery was positioned during the early part of the fight. And, you know, we're not sure exactly who wounded General Hood. It could have came from Smith's Battery at Devil's Den or uh, maybe uh, uh, Hazlitt's Battery in Little Round Top. Uh, but it could have come from one of the many cannons who were positioned along the Wheatfield Road and at the Peach Orchard firing across the division with explosive shell in this attack. Um, and let me just say, while we're here, let's give everyone a chance to talk while we're stopped here for a second. I want to make two points. Number one um, is that here we are, you know, about a quarter of the way through the attack, and uh, Mary had mentioned the idea that, oh, it's rugged and everything like that. This is nothing, okay? We haven't even entered what we call the Gettysburg Sill that runs diagonally through this battlefield, which is why there's rocks on the flanks of the Union fish hook, okay? There's rocks on the round tops and around that area, and there's rocks on Culp's Hill, but not for the rest of the battlefield. We are still outside the Gettysburg Sill. There's going to be a massive terrain change that the Confederate Command don't even know about that is coming up. The other thing I wanted to point out is for all the terrain pieces we're pointing out here is that I don't think we've actually pointed out specifically to people that don't know it otherwise. The large pointy hill with the woods on it, that's big round top. Okay, these trees right here, and that was a screen of trees probably lower during the battle. The park has done a great job with tree clearing and uh, tree retention in this area. That is, those trees were here, and right beyond it is Little Round Top. Trust me, you'll see it soon. And right to the left of those trees, in the left side, in front of Little Round Top, is Devil's Den. Okay, we are headed right for that. We are on the path of the first Texas, approximately, maybe the third Arkansas, going toward the triangular field. Around this time, you're going to have Anderson's Brigade of Georgians still in the woods. They're going to step off when we get a little bit further here. We can see Law's Brigade over there. They're taking heavy fire from two guns at Devil's Den, and that's going to cause the Alabamians to rearrange, and the Texans themselves are splitting at this point because we are going to have the first and the third, the first, uh, the third Arkansas and the first Texas, they're trying to go up the Emmitsburg Road. In the meantime, the fourth and the fifth Texas are sticking with Law over there, and the Texas Brigade splits. By the time the first and third uh, uh, go this way, they straighten out, but there's a gap between them. Eventually, two of Law's regiments, 44 and 48th Alabama, are going to fill that gap, but now both 
brigades are commingled and both brigades are attacking Devil's Den and both brigades are attacking Little Round Top and that is not a way to go into battle. Doug? Yeah, so this makes all the sense in the world. Think about how this plays out. We've talked about this idea of a wave attack from south to north. When the soldiers first come out, for instance, when we talk about Law's Brigade, they actually start on the other side of the woods. When they crest Seminary Ridge and start into this attack, they are now in the open and they say they go at the double quick. Now it's too far for them to go at the double quick all the way across this ground. But effectively what that means is they get well out ahead of where this Texas Brigade is and as they try and catch up, now all of a sudden this exacerbates that split that Gary just talked about. And on top of that, now all of a sudden drop the division commander. So at about the time they're trying to side. Follow the Emmitsburg Road or stay connected to their right. Or who's going to fill that gap? All of those would have been division commander decisions who could have helped kind of manage that chaos as they come across this field. Good. Uh, Dan Mary, we good? Anything else? Yeah, one of the things I'd like to add is that four companies from Law's Brigade are thrown out as skirmishers. Now, we know that the 2nd United States sharpshooters are out on the federal skirmish line uh, engaging the Confederates, but it seems to me, Doug, throwing out four companies into a skirmish line, that's just taking men off the firing line and adding to more of the chaos. <laughs> good. Um, good. Mary? Uh, yeah, the other thing I'd add is remember again how important the fact is that law is all the way over on Big Round Top. And so there's a tremendous delay in getting anyone in charge over here so it becomes a brigade by brigade, brigade commanders trying to coordinate, and it's difficult to do in fire. Okay, good, excellent. Let's keep moving. You're watching the American Battlefield Trust Gettysburg 155 Live. We're on Facebook. We might be on YouTube a little bit, uh, either now or eventually. Um, and uh, here we are, walking Hood's Charge at Gettysburg. This is the first, and you could say, most important attack of the day on July 2nd. Um, and I didn't expect my feet to be so wet today. Maybe it'll feel good in a little while as it gets hotter and hotter here. Um, but here we go. So we are walking along here, man. Remember, these troops have been through a lot already. I love this story. Tim knows a lot of the story of, um, you know, a guy on the way up here who, you know, lost his hat. He took a hat off of a Yankee, lost that hat at some point, um, and then he was able to, uh, um, you know, he could never find his hat. And they didn't know his name. He was in Company K. Only later did another guy go and get some water from a river, and he thought the river, the, the water tasted weird. He was afraid there was something foul in there, and the river water had gotten into their cooking pot, and when they dug into the cooking pot, they found, quote, the well-boiled cap of Company K. Water would be a big issue here. There was no water that the Confederates had access to. A lot of them went into battle on the second hottest day of the summer without any water, okay? And some of them didn't have their canteens because the closest water was far away, so canteen details hadn't even gotten back yet. Whose idea was this to walk across this field, by the way? <laughs> All right, who wants to jump in? So if you think about it, Gary just told a great story about a lieutenant or about a uh, young officer. Uh, the 4th Texas, the company I, uh, had a reputation of uh, all of their junior officers being killed. Right before they step off on this attack, one of their lieutenants gets named the company commander of Company I. And of course, all his supporting messmates step up and go, you're a goner now, too bad I can't help you, because they all are teasing him with the prospect that now he's in command, he will not make it through this battle. Ironically enough, through all the fighting that the 4th Texas does on the 2nd of July, he will live and he'll be unscratched in all of this fighting that we see. If I'm correct, you know, Company I of the 4th Texas is one that goes out on the skirmish line and then doesn't even fall in with his regiment on Little Round Top, ends up fighting along with the 1st Texas at Devil's Den. So even further commingling. And the 1st Texas already has more companies than any other regiment here. Um, I think they're the only ones with a Company M. Um, yeah, I think we may have to go through this block over here. Check this out. So soldiers were often confronted with fence lines and whatnot. We're going to see what we come across um, over here. I think I've gone through the middle before. Um, as we go. And Gary, uh, speaking of uh, soldiers' hardships, I think we should mention Law's Alabama Brigade, even though we're following the Texans. Law's Brigade woke up that morning, 2 a.m. They were at a place called New Guilford, or um, closer to, a, at the time, called Duffield. Um, they, by 3 a.m., they were on the road marching to Gettysburg. They marched 25 miles that day to get here before getting into line of battle and launching this attack. So it's July 2nd, you know, it must be like 90 degrees and they just walked 25 miles and now they're gonna charge across these fields and charge up these hills across this ground? 
It's hard to imagine. Yeah, it really is. So this is just a, look at this tiny water course that can cause all sorts of trouble. Look at professional Connor manages to keep the camera steady even as she may slip on a slippery rock. We hope she's okay. Yes, she's back up. All righty then. Let's uh, go offline for a second while we can uh, cross safely here. Here, anybody need a hand? Good. Um, so here we are walking. This is this is right on the line of the attack of the first Texas. Check this out. Again, keep hitting us with your questions. Um, by the way, if you're hearing static, the good chance is, is that it was all of the grass and the the uh, the dry grass we are going through. It's wet at the bottom, dry at the top, and I know it makes a lot of noise. Of course, we don't have the luxury of mowing the entire field of Hood's attack before we do it. I guess we do have the luxury of deciding what in the world we want to do um, in order to cross fences, and we do have a fence coming up, so let's see what we can do about that. Let's go. So Dan brought up the idea that there's U.S. sharpshooters out here. What we should think about them is think about Special Operations Forces in 1863. These would have been the second U.S. sharpshooters. To join the unit, you had to volunteer. In order to get in, you had to put 10 shots in a 5-inch circle at 200 yards. They wore green uniforms with rubber buttons that didn't glint in the sun. They used breech-loading sharps rifles so they could hide behind rocks and trees. So that gave them an increased volume of fire and the idea that they could hide behind rocks and trees meant that they gave a extra uh, hard uh, fight to these Confederates coming and made their numbers because there's only about 167 of them out here uh, and it makes their numbers seem much larger than the few companies that they have that are harassing them. And evidence of their harassment is significant because almost everybody who makes this attack writes about those skirmishers or those U.S. sharpshooters who are out here. Yeah, and Tim Smith once made the point that maybe it's the second United States sharpshooters that are really saving the Union attack here, or the Confederate attack, uh, you know, the, saving the Union from losing Little Round Top more than Warren or Vincent or other people like that. So there are lots of heroes of Little Round Top. Again, you know, here we are in the woods. It's great to be in the shade during the battle. It would have been great. The Confederates would have at least been out of direct line of sight um, of the Union soldiers shooting at them at this point. It still would have been artillery fire at this point. We're not quite within small arms range, but soon as we burst from these woods, I don't know if we're going to burst. We're more going to like crawl out of the woods here. Um, but as we come from these woods, suddenly burst upon our view will be the heights that they call Little Round Top and Devil's Den um, that we haven't seen before. Most of the Confederates considered it sort of one hill when they first saw it here because it kind of does look like one. We'll let you decide when we go. We good? All right, here we go. Let's go. Watch yourselves here. Uh, I think following Doug might be good over here. But I, I can't say it enough. Getting off the beaten path and coming out and going where the soldiers went, not just along the road, that's how you connect with a battlefield in a deeper way. By all means, following the tour route is just great, but man, if you are able, and if this is your sort of thing, you know, hottest day of the year, getting really wet in the morning with difficult equipment, then come on and do it. Um, if not, just follow along with us, the American Battlefield Trust, along this battlefield. We'll get through this and we'll be back with more audio in a sec. Enjoy the uh, rare silence. So uh, we're getting ready to come across the Timbers Farm. Now, most people refer to this as the Timbers Farm because James Timber lived here at the time they drew the Warren map of the battlefield in 1868-1869. Timbers purchased the farm after the Civil War. At the time of the battle, it was owned by a guy named George Weikert. Yes, another Weikert. And of course, we talk a lot about those uh, local families and local names. Um, Weikert, George W. Weikert, his father is George Weikert, who has a farm at the base of uh, Little Round Top. And if you come out here, and of course, you might come out here in the winter, you can find the foundation of the Weikert house and the Weikert barn directly in front of us. Okay, good. Uh, we'll call that camera the main camera, so let's make sure we're still talking to cameraman okay. White. And we'll make sure that Connor can get what she can. Check this out. It's like the gladiator here. I'm um, walking through the field. This is neat now. You know, remember. More like Apocalypse Now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that might be more accurate. One day it started raining. I don't think that's from Apocalypse Now, though. Um, but, you know, imagine this. You know, the troops had to walk through something like this. I doubt it was all genetically modified crops and whatnot. But it still would have been really hard for them to deal with. Uh, yes, and you know, we are crossing the ground on the same day that they would have crossed the ground. So, I mean, although it might be a little bit different now, I, the conditions must have been very similar. Yeah. Uh, let's pause up here once we get a view of the hills in front and reassess what we're talking about, okay? 
Yeah. It looks like we're coming to near the edge of the hill. This is where Reed Good Recon comes into play with leadership. <laughs> right here. I don't know why Doug Dow's insisted on taking this route. <laughs> hey, this might be a good place to go. Right here, sir. How about if we pause real quick here for a sec? Uh, it's low here because there's some nasty bushes, probably some with thorns, lots of ticks, but here we are, right? So we can't exactly see um, everything around here, but finally, through the sun, you can probably see the Devil's Den Ridge right there and how it blends into the ridge behind it, which is really Little Round Top in actuality. Between us and Devil's Den, that's the triangular field. And what do you think, y'all? Are we in rifle and small arms range now from the Union on top of Devil's Den? Yes. Well, 350 yards would be effective range where they would fire volleys at the enemy. And no doubt, um, we're in range of the artillery fire of Captain James Smith of the 4th New York Independent Battery. And what's really interesting about that is in his account of the battle, he describes how he fires at the Confederate advance until they reach a spot where they start down a hill and they actually go down into a valley out of range of his guns. And of course, when the Southern Army charges up the hill, he's not going to be able to have an impact on the fire against them. And I think this is really interesting. First of all, this is obvious, but this is not just any hill he's going down. It's that hill. It's that hill right there. This is what Smith is talking about, and that's what battlefields are all about. We're not guessing as to what it was. We know where Smith was. We know where the Confederates came in. That's the valley that we're going to go down right now, and it is a precipitous valley to be sure. Now, uh, let me just set the stage real quick. We're right along the line of the 1st Texas. We know where they went, and we know on their left was the largest regiment on either side at Devil's Den, the 3rd Arkansas. They enter Rose Woods off to the camera's left over there, and they start confronting three and a half Union regiments over there. We're talking about the 17th Maine at the edge of the wheat field, the 20th Indiana, 99th Pennsylvania, 86th New York, so really four regiments, and, and they're all doing that in there. It's a big regiment, but they cannot go any further. They put up a tough fight, but they're occupying four Union regiments at this time. Off on our right, the Texans are alone. Remember, they split, okay? So at this point, there's no one on there right there, and the Union is strongly posted with something like, um, you know, 1,600 soldiers, about a foot per man between the wheat field and the crest of Devil's Den with four guns upon the top. What does anyone else have to add at this point? I would say, you know, think about the idea that Tim just talked about, the notion that Smith's guns will go ahead and stop targeting these men because they're unable to depress their artillery barrels to target them. If you're an infantryman sitting there, you got to be thrilled to death that Smith is pounding these guys as they come across this field. And once it gets to the point that he can no longer target them, now all of a sudden they know this is now an infantryman's fight. All that burden falls to them if they're going to stop this attack. And when we think about it, in the Civil War, those small arms are responsible for anywhere between 75% and 91 percent of all casualties so they knew that burden was on them anyway but it sure was great having Smith's guns hit these men uh, these Confederates as they cross these fields yeah and, and as they come across and I'm gonna set Tim up real quick right here um, you have James Smith first of all we said the Texans go down and he no longer had a target but then up comes Anderson and Benning behind yes. them it's probably that very woodlot that made him in the smoke and confusion that made him follow Robertson's brigade that's the hoods Texans instead of laws brigade over there while this would help tip the scales for the Confederates of Devil's Den imagine 13 1,500 more Georgians attacking Little Round Top. Could the Union have held out? I don't know. But James Smith is desperate. His guns are in a difficult position. His commander, or the Union Army commander, said he'd probably lose his guns um, when he was up on that position, but they thought it was an important position to hold. And when he was out of one type of ammunition, I'm going to quiz Tim here, he was told he was out of it. He said, give them solid shot. Give them shell. Damn them. Give them anything? Give them anything. <laughs> Although he said it with you. Let's try that again, Tim. Damn them. Give them anything. Good. All right. Good. What do you got? Um. Well, you know, James Smith is an interesting person. There's lots of accounts written by him. But it's interesting also to me that up until about 10 years ago, we just had to imagine Smith's battery in this attack, uh, in this firing, in this attack. Because this area 10 years ago was completely and utterly wooded. And they just opened it up, and now it looks more like it did at the time of the battle. This is cool. We have a terrain change coming. Watch your step, please. Wow. I had no idea the wings were bigger than me either. Yeah. <laughs> I know we had a lot of rain. I thought, oh, I'll get wet up to my knees. Now I'm wet up to my arms. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so You're check off. this out. Look at this beautiful view here. 
Um, and I think we have some really rugged terrain here, but we're descending that ground that you can now see where Smith could not really fire so low. He couldn't depress his barrels low enough to get down in here. And what we're doing is we still have a while to go before we reach that apparently lush, uh, grassy knoll of the triangular field up there. Triangular because it's surrounded by stone or fence walls there, and it's a landlocked piece of land owned by a guy named Weikert. Um, let's continue on. Anything to add before we do? You know, once again, notice the uphill attack of the Confederates are forced to make. Yes. They'll do it over and over and over again here at Gettysburg. And this is a great view of that uphill attack up the triangular field. And let's remember these Texans marched six to eight miles before they could right. make their attack. The right. Alabamians over here marched 23-ish miles before they could make their attack over here. And then on the second hottest day of the summer, and it's a very hot day today, again, steaming hot water inside their canteens. If they had any canteens, they're gonna have to go over by far the most difficult terrain Gettysburg has to offer. And that's what we're doing right now, of course, we're not climbing Big Round Top. We didn't stay up all night. We didn't march 23 miles over a mountain. We have it easy. Let's go. Yeah, and it's, remember, this is all James Longstreet's fault, according to Robert E. Lee this morning. <laughs> You're right. He Well, that's interesting. If he was supposed to attack up the Emmitsburg Road, where would Hood's right have been? Hood famously said in the movie, and he said in history, that if he turned right with Little Round Top over there, they would simply be able to roll the loose rocks down upon them. Where would the Confederate right have been? Maybe in these woods? Would it have been further to the west? pretty interesting thought. So it's also interesting to consider, you know, as we're down in this valley and you think about the idea, we said Hood goes down, now this becomes a brigade commander's fight. Well, that's true. If you're a brigade commander and Robertson decides he's going to stay with the 3rd Arkansas and 1st Texas, and as he comes this way, how much time are you now thinking about with a Union line directly in front of you? The opportunity to think about, oh, we should make some broad sweeping flank attack. The, the idea of all the, the intricacies of operational art, we're past this. There's a Union line right in front of them, and that's who we have to get if we're going to be successful. So once you see the exigencies, the immediacy of this fight will soak up all their attention. So the idea of some nifty little move or tactic or maneuver, we're past that point when we get to this place on the battlefield at that time in the day. And I just want to point out, if I may, I'm yelling because I know it's hard to get over the, the grass here, but um, we can't even walk through this shoulder to shoulder and there's eight of us. Okay, imagine the 7,000 soldiers of Hood's division attacking in this area. They're trying to maintain shoulder to shoulder, but if you come across a big rock, you got to go around it. There's a thorn bush in front of you, you go through it. Okay, so I just can't stress enough how instructive doing this is. And I imagine watching it on video uh, doesn't even quite give the full picture of how we're struggling with all sorts of things underfoot here. Wow. <laughs> Most definitely, uh, watch yourself here. Stone wall here. Um, and as Tim said, we didn't know a lot of this was here until we plowed through the woods years ago, until the park cleared a lot of it here. Wow, the agriculture is flying off into our faces. <laughs> and note, on we walk, and we still haven't reached the triangular field. Um, uh, this battlefields are like this, pickets charge is the same way. You think you've walked for a while, and you're not even halfway there. We are finally approaching the final descent at the triangular field here. <laughs> ah, now we can see the terrain. Hold on, let's set it up real quick. We gotta keep walking, but at this point, here are the Texans coming up here for their final advance. The 124th New York, you might be able to see their monument on the left, right next to the tree line over there, um, is up there waiting for us. The guns are about to fall silent, at least for the Texans. The 3rd Arkansas is in the woods, and unbeknownst to the Texans, the 44th and 48th Alabama have been detached over in that direction, and they are moving in this direction with the sole aim of trying to silence or capture Smith's battery atop Devil's Den. Any other observations before we move? No, so this is a great point. If you wonder about the effectiveness of Smith's guns, not only as they make this approach, but the idea that Law is going to take two-fifths of his combat power and send it down here in an effort to silence those guns is proof of his uh, effectiveness during this advance. Good. Yeah, but keep that in mind. Only the reserve brigades, Anderson and Benning, are able to keep any remote sense of brigade semblance after the fighting really begins. Yeah, you can't be in two places at once. I always imagine the soldiers trying to walk across this ground and look to the front and try to watch for possible bullets flying in at them. You know, I, I'd imagine at this point you just have to just keep going forward and hope that you don't get hit with something that you can possibly avoid. You're just hunkered down, right, Tim? Yeah. Hunkered down and moving. And of course, we're going to cross over uh, what we refer to as Rose Run. Of course, this is, comes from a spring out of the Rose Farm area. 
So what do you think? If you're in this attack, are you going to stop and pause and fill your canteen in the midst of this? Or would you like to stop and fill your canteen in the midst of this? Or is all your attention focused on the Union soldiers in front of you? Oh, I'm glad you said that because we have one account of this by a, uh, by a guy named William C. Ward. Ward was going along racing with another private soldier. He's in the 4th Alabama, a little further to the right, but this same water course. And he was ordered to keep moving. He could not stop. So he was said to uh, him or his buddy, actually, put his gun down in the water as a prop, put his other hand down in the water as a prop and scooped up one mouthful of succulent, tasty, thirst-quenching water and then continued to march, which by the way, we have tried to do and that is not easy. In fact, we've never remotely <laughs> succeeded at it. I encourage you all, come up to Rose Run, put one hand and a stick down and see if you can scoop one thing of water as you go because to stop and drink, you're gonna be prodded by the Provo Marshal and file closers with bayonets and other things behind you. You gotta keep moving. Stopping is a horrible thing to do at this point. We talked about this at Gaines's Mill the other day. And if you do try that, the American Battlefield Trust is not responsible for any waterborne diseases that you catch. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be talking about that later at a place called the Trough Rock, too, if we visit it. Let's get across safely here. Okay. Oh, man, here's the final advance here. At least so they thought. Somebody said, no words can... Um, express the sublimity with which I surveyed the wild scene. The crashing of the rocks against the, uh, the crashing of the shells against the rocks, the shouts of the combatant, the, the screaming of the shells, and all of their uh, um, noises as they hit the rocks, all blended together into one dread chorus, which no power of expression could compass. Um, that's William Flake per Perry of the 44th Alabama. So here we go, we're not quite in the triangular field yet. And then, well, I guess we'll have to talk about the triangular field, Tim, because a lot of people are thinking what it is. But let's hold off on that for a second. Now, oh, this man. area we're crossing now is very, very swampy. <laughs> At the very base of the ridge we came off of and the ridge we are attacking in front of us. Maybe when we get to the top, we can pan down upon our legs and shoes and see the water oozing out of them here. <laughs> And this is more like a Apocalypse Now, I think, than <laughs> the Gladiator. Or Monday at the office for the trust. <laughs> oh. All right, all the difficulties must be over now. <laughs> I know we have another little run to cross, but uh, here we are on a trail here. Let's pause for a sec, let us catch up, and uh, Tim, Tell us what you know about this thing. Oh, cool. So we are on a embankment that was created by the Gettysburg Electric Railway in 1893. From 1893 until 1916, there was a trolley that ran around the battlefield on what was then private property adjacent to battlefield land. The trolley st had several stops. There were amusement parks created. There was a... Um, uh, uh, a restaurant and a You're killing us tent saloon. Yeah, there it is. Okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. There was a restaurant and a saloon at Devil's Den, and um, uh, people would ride around on the trolley and uh, stop at these different locations. Uh, Mrs. Tipton, who ran the restaurant, said that on a busy day in the summer, maybe 3,000 people would stop at Devil's Den and visit it. One thing we always like to make a point of, we'll make it again uh, up there, is the commercialism that occurred at Devil's Den after the battle is incredible. And it's hard to imagine that possibly on a busy day 100 years ago, more people were at this location than they are today. Hold on. Uh, Bob, man, you going to show a picture of the trolley? I really, really want to, and I'm hoping okay. I'm close. I must be close because I see other trolley pictures. Oh, man, there's there the, that's there's the trolley, one. but hold on. I want it at Devil's Den. There, there it is. So there's the electric trolley at Devil's Den. That's a little round top in the background, um, and that uh, the photo was taken from Devil's Den. The um, trolleys were named after core commanders as well, um, and this, uh, this one that you're seeing, I think, is, well, at least one in this photograph there is the Howard. We also have a photo of the Sykes. Was there a Sickles, Tim? Uh, I... I, I think so. He did create the park, so yes. say what you want about yes. Sickles. He founded the bill that created the Gettysburg National Military Park, so maybe he deserves a trolley. And maybe you can look down this path and see that the trolley, what is remains of the trolley tracks, uh, runs for, I think it's about 3,000 feet, it doesn't accord to the account, from the bend near Devil's Den all the way up towards the Peach Orchard. And today, this path is used by the Boy Scouts as part of their walking trail. 
Yeah, it is a nice raised bed, and by the way, it would make a sharp curve over there south of Devil's Den, and there was a single track, so there was a mechanism warning about tr about uh, trolley cars coming back. The mechanism failed a few times. You have people bumping, in, trolleys bumping into each other, people being thrown bodily from it, lacerations, broken bones, no deaths, although the trolley did cross uh, Warren Avenue after cars had been invented and smacked into a car, and I believe somebody was killed. You know, was a, there was a guy killed in the town of Gettysburg at some point, too, when the trolley, he fell in front of the trolley tracks and it ran over him. And we'll cover all this um, when we get up to Devil's Den um, a little bit later, but we're getting close. Here we are in the triangular field. Look, there are places for the Texans to get a little bit of cover here. I'm not sure what good that did them. They got to get to the top. Right now, the men of the 124th New York, 238 soldiers, the smallest regiment at Devil's Den now sees two massive regiments coming this way and probably is unaware um, of the Confederates uh, that are also coming from the south at this point. Anybody have anything else before we can commence again? All right, onward toward the top. This is getting intense. All right, here we go. First Texas moving toward the top of the hill. It must have looked like a really impressive uh, artillery crowned height. Maybe it looked like a mini volcano, which is what they called Little Round Top at the time. Um, this is rough. You have a guy named George Todd next to a soldier named E.P. Derrick. Uh, Derrick is crouched behind a rock. It could be one of these right here, because we know we're on the first Texas's line when an artillery shell comes in and hits, hits Derrick uh, in the head and splattered his brains among about the face of his company commander as they continued onward. in the triangular field right now. We've already crossed a low stone wall, and here's another wall that apparently I'm having trouble getting over here. But let me just say, I've never done this attack sort of in real time on a video before, and this is fascinating because I keep thinking of everything that's going on at this point. Here, you have the Georgians coming up behind you. Here, you have the Texans getting ready to silence the guns. In fact, Smith's guns are probably silent at this point, or just about at this point. Um, you have a Georgian coming up at this point, trying to save the Texans, and uh, he's saying, I've got it. He gets hit in the leg, and he goes back to the rear. The Georgians are already warning their friends not to come up here. It's a deadly place to go. I need to stop talking for a sec. So the Texans, if we just look at that moment you were talking about, let's say the Texans are right here. We just crossed over the, uh, south, I guess uh, maybe it's the southeastern stone wall of the triangular-shaped field. There's lots of cover for the Texans in this area. It would be very um, convenient for them to have stopped the attack at this point and just stayed behind those rocks. Up behind them, the Georgians have now broken out of the woods. And two regiments from Lowell's Brigade, as we said, were actually coming across the open fields over near the Slider Farm. You can see the Slider Farm clearly. And Benning must see those two regiments crossing uh, in front of Big Round Top, and instinctively, instead of heading up Big Round Top behind Law's Brigade, Benning swings and Benning heads towards Devil's Den. So the Texans all know it, but in a few minutes, another column is coming behind them as relief. And of course, perhaps Smith's batteries are firing at them until the Texans get close to the bottom of the hill, and then he pulls away from his guns. And we, but we, one ahead. final thing, um, Smith, who writes about it years later, maintains it was not him that left the guns, but he maintains his infantry support left the guns, and he says that for 40 minutes, yep. he stayed on top of the hill with his guns by himself, which is absolutely not true. But he gives one of the greatest quotes I'd ever heard. In that, in, ever read in that, in that um, book. He says that each one of those 40 minutes contained 60 seconds, and each of those seconds was a lifetime. <laughs> That's good stuff. It would be great to talk, and I'm a big fan, but let me let somebody else talk now, because I think we're right at the perfect time where the Texans are about to capture the hill, and somebody goes up to the colonel of the 124th New York. You can see their monument up there. Uh, Augustus Van Horn Ellis, former sea captain, offered command of the Hawaiian Navy, went all the way to Hawaii, a six-month trip, found they didn't have a single ship, came back the long way just in time for the Civil War. Somebody goes up to him and suggests the 124th charge into the disorganized Texans. The Texans are 50% larger in number than uh, the 124th New York. Who knows that story? Doug, Tim, 
So I believe it's, it's Major Cromwell, right? It's yes. the executive officer who makes the suggestion. At first he thinks, bad idea. But then as he starts to see them faltering out here, all of a sudden is this a culmination point? Can they save their position by attacking? And so what they're going to do is they're going to come down here and to their horror, what they're going to see is both Cromwell and uh, Manning are going to be shot uh, while they're down here. They're going to take all kinds of losses and drive those Texans down to that wall that we just walked over before they will finally, because of force of numbers, be forced to go back and they will carry their commander and lay him on the rock where we see their monument to this day. And, and let's let's talk about this. I'm going to put Tim on the spot here or anybody else that wants to speak up with it. Here we go. We've got, uh, you know, uh, Ellis and uh, Cromwell go in on horseback and Captain Silliman comes up and says, you know, don't go in that way. Don't do this. And Ellis simply sums up the key, uh, you know, virtue, one of the key virtues of a Civil War commander. And that is, he says, the men must see us today. Summarizing right there how you need to display bravery, sometimes reckless bravery, as they called it back then, recklessly exposing himself. That's not what we call it today, to be sure. Um, if you wrote something like that, that is why he did it. He would pay with his life. So would Major Cromwell. The lieutenant colonel, a guy named Cummins, uh, would also go down wounded, and the 124th New York is left without a field officer. They're out in this field, and what happens at this point? Here they are. They push the Texans back, I failed to mention. The Texans form, reform at the base of the hill over there. Benning's guys are coming up, and right when the 124th New York is down here without a field officer, up comes the 44th and 48th Alabama. These are laws guys that were coming up to silence the guns over here. And all of a sudden, the 124th New York meets disaster and the smallest regiment at Devil's Den will lose more killed than any other regiment for the Union in the whole vicinity. So the whole idea that nature abhors a vacuum Civil War lines abhor a hole in it. And so we talked about how this uh, this Texas Brigade divides as they come across here. And so how do they fill it? The 44th and 48th conveniently will fill that gap in the line so that it is now one contiguous line and they have no holes and flanks to be attacked or, or that they are not vulnerable even as they are out here making this. So it happens by, by uh, individual brigade commanders making decisions rather than with that coordinated division commander putting place troops into place to go ahead and fix any of the uh, any of the decisions that they had to make as long as they were making contact along the way. Okay, good. Think, think about just for two seconds. Think about what we've talked about here. We have men coming out of the woods, reforming in this area. Um, Texas troops here, uh, Georgia troops coming in behind. It's a vortex of activity right in this area. Okay, good. We got to keep moving. We got to go to the top. We might do a somewhat silent march till we can get up there. There is a trail that comes up here, but why bother at this point? We've come all the way across the field. So onward here. If I had a sword, I'd put my hat up on it here. Your new hat, Gary? Yeah, my new hat, as a matter of fact. I'm sure you're already commenting on it. It hasn't come up yet. So uh, I'm not asking for your opinion. This isn't a democracy, but I know you're going to give it anyway. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, I need a variety of hats, especially after I was totally emasculated yesterday by a much cooler... Whoa. Okay. Speaking of emasculation, a uh, much cooler Phil Spoggy hat. So now I think I need to try some new ones and beat these up as well. Thanks, Chris. If you're looking for hat sponsorship, that's Gary Edelman at the American Battlefield Trust. <laughs> I need a GoFundMe page for poor Gary's hat. <laughs> All right, here we are. It would have been intense here. Enjoy the view. Ah, here's the trail. Just imagine. leaving the triangular field. I'm sure some of the people know that uh, Gary and I co-authored a book about the fighting at Devil's Den, and uh, the triangular field was an interesting chapter in our book. I remember uh, one of my favorite lines in the book that was 
written by Gary was that after the fight, the Triangular Field became a virtual carpet of blue and gray and red. So here we are. We're going to wrap it up while we're up here. But, uh, you know, the 124th New York is gone. Smith's guns, one has been removed. Three sit silent on the top. Um, the Texans are coming to take the hill. There's Georgia behind them. Um, who wants to wrap this up so we can come at a good stopping point before we start Devil's Den? We're all tired. <laughs> I'll do it. Come on, get up here. All right, so if we imagine where we were, we talked about, oh, oh, we've been setting this up for the whole time we've crossed here. So now we have these Texans in Arkansas and coming through here. We have these men from Alabama attacking from the south. And now what they're going to have, with this pressure from both the west and the south, this position will literally implode. And at that point now, we would start to see Union soldiers retreating back across the back side of this, down Hawks Ridge. And we'll be able to see a better shot of that when we're up on a little round top. But you can see how they lose this position. It's pressure, not just from their front, from the west, from the direct we came from but also from the south and that's what's going to be the final end of this position on top of that throw those two more waves of brigades behind that are going to add the weight to clear all this out no matter how many men come from the northern side they come from the wheat field the 99th pennsylvania uh, the 40th new york all those units that come down here are not enough to stem this weight coming across this field and in essence this attack this plan this wave attack it's working it's drawing union forces from other side of the union line down to this part of the field and weakening those places on the northern end of the field and we'll get to those later in the day. Right, but ultimately Devil's Den will fall but the Union line will hold and a lot of it has to do with the disorganization caused by the southern assault. At the, uh, during the climax of the fighting at Devil's Den it was sort of a seesaw battle and at one point during the fighting Confederate artillery is lobbing shells into this area, Union artillery is lobbing shells into this area and there's hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the crest of the hill and it's just chaos. During the fighting, our Colonel Jack Jones of the 20th Georgia is hit in the back of the shell with an artill, or back of the head with an artillery shell, and killed in the fighting. And of course, the Confederate, uh, the Confederate Army, who is so successful in this attack, will reach the top of this hill just to see that there is another stronger northern line on the other side of it. Must have been disheartening. And we're going to pick up later um, at Devil's Den. I want to have one, bring Mary on for our last thing. We won't have her on anymore. So let's just 20 seconds on why you like being, a, or if you like being a licensed battlefield guy to get his work. And if so, why 20 seconds? All right. I love being a licensed battlefield guy because you get to do stuff like this. You'd never do this off the beaten track. And years and years of coming here, I've never done it. That's what you get to do. It's Very great. cool. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you all for watching. Thanks to everybody here, and thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation. We'll reappear in just a few, uh, very shortly, at Devil's Den.